Hello everyone. Today we're going to be discussing life on the plains, specifically taking a look at the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes who have a long history in the Colorado region. So the Colorado Territory is often characterized as being part of the Great American Desert prior to the arrival of European settlers. However, scattered along Colorado's front range were several bands of Native American peoples most notably the Cheyenne and Arapaho. And on your left, you can see a general map of the approximate tribal locations in the United States prior to European contact. Now, I have to say that this is a, a very imprecise map because uh, these territories were very fluid in the Native American culture and often changed, but this is kind of gives you a general idea of where they were located. And uh, then on the right, you'll see a Southern Plains delegation. This is a photo taken in 1863. So the Cheyenne Nation, as we'll call them, was once comprised of 10 bands that stretched from Southern Colorado all the way to the Black Hills of South Dakota. Now, at the time of European contact, the Cheyenne people occupied primarily territory located in modern day Minnesota. However, as Europeans continued to arrive in the Americas, Cheyenne natives were pushed west into modern-day Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming. Today, the Cheyenne people are split into two federally recognized nations, the Southern Cheyenne, who are located in Oklahoma, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Northern Cheyenne, who now live in the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation in Montana. Now, Arapaho territory once stretched from Canada's Saskatchewan River to present-day Montana and Wyoming, as well as western South Dakota and eastern Colorado. Now, after the arrival of Europeans in North America, the Arapaho engaged heavily in horse and bison robe trading <clears throat> excuse me, at outposts on the Arkansas River in which the Cheyenne were middlemen. This forged a close alliance between the two tribes, the Cheyenne and Arapaho. However, prosperous times for the Cheyenne and Arapaho would come to an end when American settlers began traveling west. During this period of westward expansion, the Cheyenne and Arapaho frequented trading posts on Colorado's Front Range and engaged in regional trade and occasionally clashed with European trappers and American pioneers. By the 1850s, the Arapaho consisted of two bands, the Northern Arapaho and the Southern Arapaho. Today, the Northern Arapaho live with the Eastern Shushone on the, on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, while the Southern Arapaho share reservations with the Southern Cheyenne in Oklahoma. Together, their members are federally recognized in the U.S. as the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes. <clears throat> For both the Cheyenne and the Arapaho people, the relationship with animals was central to their way of life. <coughs> Excuse me. The buffalo was a staple of the Plains Indians' diet and was widely regarded as sacred. Buffalo hunts were common among the natives of the Plains, and they were hunted using traditional tactics that included the use of Clovis point spears and arrows which you see pictured in the middle there. And uh, these Clovis points are still found throughout Colorado's front range where arrowhead hunting has become a popular pastime. Now, despite not being native to the Americas, the horse soon also became a mainstay of native life on the Colorado's front range. By the 1600s, thanks to Spanish conquest, Horses became widely available throughout the Americas, including in what would become the Colorado Territory. The horse was first brought to the New World in 1519 by Cortez, who brought with him over 600 horses and livestock. These animals would go on to escape their Spanish masters and breed successfully throughout the continent, creating a new invasive species in the Americas that was quickly utilized by native people. Now, as horses continued to arrive in the Americas throughout the time of Spanish conquest, 
and were brought west by Spanish conquistadors, uh, most notably uh, conquistadors like Francisco Cornardo and Don Diego Vargas, who uh, actually explored parts of modern-day Colorado in 1540 and 1694, respectively. Now, the arrival of the horse in the New World triggered a shift amongst both the Cheyenne and the Arapaho from a more sedentary lifestyle that included the construction of permanent earth lodges to more of a hybrid lifestyle. This hybrid lifestyle included the transport and erection of teepees along migratory trails, such as the Santa Fe tra Trail located along Colorado's Front Range. And as part of this hybrid lifestyle, the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes engaged in farming practices that included the planting and harvesting of corn, squash, and beans, which were known as the Three Sisters of Native Agriculture. Generally, Native tribes would plant crops and establish a semi-permanent village in the spring, harvest in the fall, and engage in traditional hunting practices in the winter. Popular winter hunting grounds included modern-day Manitou Springs and Colorado Springs, as well as various locations along Colorado's Front Range and San Luis Valley. Now, traditionally, the religion of the Cheyenne and Arapaho included a kind of animism or the religious idea that the universe and all the natural objects, including animals, plants, trees, rivers, and mountains, have souls or spirits. The Arapaho believed in the great spirit Manitou, an omnipresent entity that manifests itself in all living things. Manitou Springs in Colorado would later become the namesake of uh, the small town that we know it as today, uh, which originated as a boom town located just south of Colorado Springs under the shadow of Pikes Peak. Uh, this was once a summer settlement for these Plains Indians. Now the rituals of the Cheyenne and Arapaho included the sweat lodge ceremony, vision quest in which young men would engage in a coming of age ritual, and the Sundance, which you see pictured on your left. The Sundance held, held a particular importance that included ritualistic dancing and fasting for up to four days. Those engaging in the Sundance would draw elaborate body paint and sacrifice land, a personal object, or fast in return for supernatural assistance from the Great Spirit. For the Arapaho, the most important tribal symbol of their bond with the Great Spirit was the flat pipe. The sacred flat pipe was the tribal medicine of the Arapaho and was always kept with the northern band of the tribe, usually located in modern day Montana. The supernatural power of the flat pipe worked to heal the sick and control natural forces that would provide success in hunting, good luck, strength, long life, and victory in battle. The Arapaho mythology, excuse me, in the Arapaho mythology, the flat pipe has a direct connection to the Great Spirit and is worshipped in higher regard than the sun. By 1889, both the Cheyenne and Arapaho had embraced what's called the ghost dance movement. This was advocated by the Sioux chief Sitting Bull and it was a ritual dance that was believed to drive out whites and restore the traditional lands and way of life of these native people in North America, particularly in the Plains region. The ghost dance would go on to play a central role in the uprising that was crushed by U.S. forces at the Battle of Wounded Knee in 1890. When Europeans arrived in the New World, particularly the Spaniards spreading the message of Catholicism, this gave way to a modern hybrid religion that includes both aspects of native culture and contemporary Christian beliefs, including the worship of saints. And on your left, I'm going to play a, a quick video, um, actually a Thomas Edison video from 1895 depicting the ghost dance. It is a silent video.
Now, in addition to intertribal trade practices, the Cheyenne and Arapaho traded with Hispanos of mixed Mexican and native origin, as well as European pioneers, and received guns and horses in exchange for pelts, buffalo robes, blankets, and beads. <clears throat> The Cheyenne and Arapaho were considered a horse and warrior people and engaged in raids and warfare with both traditional enemies as well as Anglo settlers. In the native culture, warriors were viewed as not a maker of war, but rather a protector of the people. These warriors achieved rank by accumulating vict uh, victories or acts of bravery in battle known as coups. Military leaders played an important role in intertribal politics, with established warriors in charge of organizing hunts and raids, as well as enforcing discipline and tribal law. These native warriors employed a variety of traditional weapons, such as war clubs, tomahawks, and bows and arrows, as well as rifles, revolvers, and shotguns acquired through raid and trade. And on your right, you'll see a uh, famous painting depicting uh, Custer's Last Charge, or the last stand of General Custer, in, in which a uh, uh, conglomerate of different Indian tribes defeated General Custer. And we'll talk more about that later throughout this course. Now, in 1861, the Cheyenne and Arapaho were forced by American settlers to exchange the vast territory granted to them by the Fort Laramie Treaty for a reservation on Colorado's Sand Creek, not far from present-day Colorado Springs. However, once granted this location, miners and settlers continued to trespass on the reservation, and the native encampment proved to be a general nuisance to these settlers. This eventually led to a general acceptance of Indian elimination among white settlers, arguably at all costs. This sentiment gave way to the Sand Creek Massacre, when on November 29, 1864, 675 men, mostly belonging to the Colorado Volunteers, led by Colonel John M. Chivington, crossed into Cheyenne and Arapaho Territory with the intention of eliminating the encampment. Now, prior, a negotiation had taken place between Triber elders at the encampment and the Colorado governor, John Evans, that as long as the encampment waved the American flag, it would be protected under Colorado law. Despite this agreement, Colonel Chivington and his soldiers sacked the encampment at Sand Creek over which flew both the American flag and a white flag of truce. Chittington and his men proceeded to kill and mutilate over 500 Cheyenne and Arapaho, mostly women and children and elders. The massacre at Sand Creek led to war between the Arapaho and the United States until a peace treaty was signed in 1855. On your left, you'll see a depiction of the Sand Creek Massacre by a Cheyenne eyewitness and survivor, uh, the artist Howling Wolf. Um, and then on the right, you will see the Sand Creek Memorial Plate as it stood in 1985, which uh, mischaracterized the massacre as a battle. The monument has since been modified to reflect the nature of the massacre. Now regarding the image on your left, I would like to point out uh, that there were a small number of warriors at Sand Creek that you see depicted who tried to fight back against the uh, uh, Americans who heavily outnumbered them. Um, however, mostly the encampment was made up of uh, women and children as well as elders who uh, were stricken hard by disease and largely weakened at the time. So I'm going to leave you guys with a couple of quotes. Uh, first, a quote from uh, Colonel Chivington, who led the Sand Creek Massacre. Uh, he stated, Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it's right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians. Kill and scalp all, big and little. And as a contrasting quote, I'm going to leave you with the uh, congressional testimony of a soldier, Mr. John S. Smith, 
Um, this was in a uh, congressional in, uh, investigation uh, looking into the Sand Creek Massacre. He stated about the massacre that, I saw the bodies of those lying there cut all into pieces, worse mutilated than any I ever saw before. And the women cut all into pieces, with knives scalped, their brains knocked out, children two or three months old, all ages lying there, from sucking infants up to warriors. By whom were they mutilated? By the United States troops.